Oscar Romero said, Christians are peacemakers, not because they cannot fight, but because they prefer the force of peace. And so we light this candle as a symbol of the force of peace.
Now let us call ourselves to worship. God's call comes clearly to us. We will listen and respond. God's support is there for us in times of stress and peril. We will know a secure peace and return our thanks to God. God's challenge is before us. God will give us the courage to meet the challenge in the way of Jesus Christ. And now let us join our hearts together in prayer. Loving God, you sustain us when our world crumbles. You are there for us when other supports fall away. Enable us to search out the unseen glory and strength that will keep us secure when the hard times come home to us. Even though we feel like giving up, even though the way ahead seems without hope, you, O oh God, are the rock that will not move. In our darkness, you are light. In our uncertainty, you are always the same. In our despair, you are simply hope. In our fear, you will not give in and you put us back on the faithful path that Jesus pioneered. Yes, yes. You, you are there for us. Amen. Amen. 
Let us now open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to these words from the still speaking God. Let us first hear these words from Paul's letter to the Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld for the Lord, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while other judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the, the day observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. May God add God's blessings to our hearing and our understanding of these sacred words. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just, will forgive them and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us be together in the spirit of confession. You remind us, O oh God, just how hard it is to forgive. When a friend or a well-loved family member has betrayed our trust,
you remind us, O oh God, just how hard it is to forgive. When harsh words have been said that cannot be taken back, You remind us, O oh God, just how hard it is to forgive. When a promise of support, challenge, or care has been broken. You remind us, O oh God, just how hard it is to forgive. When harm is done to children or to the powerless ones. You know, O oh God, the difficulty of from the heart forgiveness when we have been hurt badly or when one of your children has been hurt. But you call us to speak words that bring peace and reconciliation and let our actions match our words. Lord, if someone sins against me, how often shall I for forgive? Seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, seventy-seven times. And so we are forgiven by God in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Some years ago, I was the new minister of a small church in one of the hill farm towns of Vermont. And as I became uh, familiar with the, uh, the people of that town, I began to hear stories about things uh, uh, that were of meaning to that town. And one of the stories I heard was about two families that had side-by-side -side, uh, farms, dairy farms. And I, I came to understand that these two families did not speak to one another. And so I inquired as to why they weren't on speaking terms. And I, I heard a rather detailed story about uh, an incident that in, uh, uh, involved the herd of one of the farms trampling over the fence and into the um, barnyard of the adjacent farm. And I gathered there was um, some damage done. And the, the farmer, the owner of the cows that had done the trampling, uh, I guess, had refused to pay for the damages that were done by his, his herd as they wandered into the neighbor's farm. And, and that was the result. And what resulted from that was that these two farmers and then their families didn't speak to each other. Now, you know, that could be a reasonable thing to expect for a while. And, and it sounded as if when these, this story was related to me, as if it had happened uh, perhaps a year or two ago before I arrived in that town. So I said, oh, so when did this incident happen? To which the reply was, oh, some 30 or 40 years ago. What a long time for two families to carry on a resentment, to be in a state of non-forgiveness, so to speak. It makes you wonder, why is forgiveness such a hard thing for we humans to do, to put into action in our lives. Why isn't it as easy as it might seem it could be? Why do we hang on to the burden of the resentments with such tenaciousness? As if those resentments are what created for us a sense of meaning in our life. Perhaps that's one reason why. They let us know who we are as opposed to who they are. Oh, we're not like them, we like to say to ourselves. I think in some ways we've got it all wrong about forgiveness. We've got it all backwards in some ways. And perhaps we don't want to face what forgiveness really means, what it means about ourselves. We don't want to face the hard work that forgiveness really requires of us if we really do forgive. First of all, it seems to me that we think of forgiveness as being a, a one-time deal. That, you know, you forgive the other person and then that's it. Or they forgive you and you can move on as if whatever happened never happened. You know, it, that's never the case, though. 
forgiveness really isn't a one-time thing. Instead, it's, it's a process. It's a process that takes a long time and even a lifetime to bring to reality. You know, the story today that uh, we get the brief little snippet of between Peter and Jesus, you know, Peter, thinking he has the answer, says, how many times do I need to forgive? Seven times? Perhaps thinking that if he forgave once a day for a week, that would be enough. (laughs) To which Jesus replied and in his way, and to Peter, no, 77 times. As if we need to be forgiving and forgiven every day for years to come. It's a process of which we need to be constantly tilling and nurturing and being aware of, lest we fall back into our old ways. Which I think leads into the next thing we have wrong about forgiveness. We think about forgiveness as being about the past, about something that has occurred in the past that is not forgivable like those farmers, the poor cow is trampling over the fences and perhaps uh, knocking over some water basins. Those things are in the past and all we need is to forgive those things in the past. But you know, we can't change what's happened in the past. That will always be. The only thing that we really can change is what will happen in the future. And so forgiveness is not necessarily about what's happened in the past. Indeed, what forgiveness is more about is making sure that the past does not limit what the future could be. To make sure that the future is not what the past was. And so forgiveness is about removing whatever it was that would be holding us back from creating that new future. The famous actress Marlena Dietrich was quoted as saying, once a woman has forgiven a man, she must not reheat his sins for breakfast. Forgiveness is about letting go of what happened in the past so that we might look forward into the future. But perhaps the the hardest thing of all is coming to understand that forgiveness is not only about the other person. And it's not dependent on whether someone apologizes for a wrongdoing. Oh, I'll only forgive them if they ask for forgiveness. No. Forgiveness is really as much about our own selves as it is about the other person. It's about releasing our own resentment that we so tenaciously hang on to, about our own responsibility for hanging on to those resentments so that we can let go into a new future. As some of you might know, I uh, spent some time in the rooms of uh, AA, 
And, and one of the exercises in the 12 steps is to do uh, a, a moral inventory, and it's rather specific how it goes. And one of the things I ask you to do is list the things that you resent. People, places, things. And then they ask you what it is about those people, people places, or things that threaten you and what is threatened by them in you. And then in the last column, they ask you to say, well, what have you done to enable them to hold that position of power? So I listed out a whole bunch of things. And the last thing on my list was my television. And I was resentful of my television because I, uh, not only was I addicted to alcohol at the time, but I was also addicted to television. I probably spent uh, four or five hours a day watching television, uh, te football, daytime drama, <laughs> you know, uh, late night talk shows. I watched it all. And I was resentful of the television because it took up so much of my time. And that it threatened my ability to do things that were really important to me. And then came that question. Well, what do I do to enable the television to do that? And I had to write down, I turn it on. And in that moment, I became acutely aware that I had the ability to turn it off. And if I turned off the television, then it wouldn't take up so much time, and it wouldn't have its power over me, and I wouldn't resent it. And so I did. Now, I do watch television from time to time these days, but it's only on specific occasion and for specific things that I truly enjoy. But most of the time, I turn it off. And so I've been able to forgive the television for its power over me. You know, when I say the Lord's Prayer, I often say that line, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, as if there were no comma between those two phrases. We normally take a big breath. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us as if they were two almost unrelated things. And yet, if we remove that comma and we remove that breath, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, the meaning changes that our own forgiveness is related equally to the forgiveness that we show to others. And it is our responsibility to turn that switch of, of resentment off. And perhaps we need to be reminded 77 times a day to turn that switch of resentment off. So that slowly by surely, day by day, what is a burden for us to do, the turning it off, becomes a habit and then becomes a way of life and then becomes the way to new life. Jesus says to Peter, no, not seven times, 77 times. And he might as well have said 777 times. I think what Jesus was saying, it needs to become a way of life, a way of new life. 
So when we pray the Lord's Prayer, let us remove that comma and remember and remind ourselves that the forgiveness of ourselves is directly related to our forgiveness of others. Amen. And now let us gather up all those prayers that we have spoken and the many more that remain unspoken but written on our hearts and lift them up to God. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, whose very nature is to be present in good times and in bad, in warm days and in cold, in wind and rain, and sunny life, in laughter and in pain, in joy and in despair, in work and in play, in all those things that are a joy of life, open our hearts and our minds to the realities of the present here and now. Turn back, O oh God, the outer layers of ourselves and look deep beneath the surface to our hidden inner depths. Many of us hide behind polite dreams and wooden responses, not daring to admit to others or even to ourselves that we are vulnerable. Yet we turn to you trusting, knowing that you will handle us carefully and tenderly. Turn back the outer layers of apparent courage and find our fears. Address them in us, acknowledge them, even as you cause us to acknowledge them before you. Do it not so much to rid us of them, though we would like to be rid of them and free from fears forever. Oh, how wonderful it would be to stand in the presence of your perfect love that casts out fear. Turn back the outer layers of apparent confidence and find our worries and our anxieties. Address them in us, acknowledge our uncertainties, even as we acknowledge them before you. Do it not so much to rid us of these fears and anxieties, though we would like to walk along some waterway and watch our worries and anxieties drown in the backwash behind us. Oh, how wonderful it would be to stand in the presence of your perfect love that calms fears and storms and worries. Still, our plea would be more modest to know that you are present with us and that we are not alone in our struggle with worry. Turn back the outer layers of apparent certainty and find our doubts. Address them in us. Help us acknowledge doubts without shame. Do it not to rid us of our doubts for we would not want to forfeit the growth that comes from ourselves and our doubts, even while we seek your purest presence. So, O oh God, our plea is more modest to make our doubts building blocks to a finer, firmer faith. 
and to know that you accompany us on our journey. We ask not that you make the hard moments of life easier, except that our burdens are eased by the assurance of your companionship, heightened by the knowledge of your loving care, strengthened by hope, shaped by love. Even as was the one in whose name we pray, and who taught us to say together, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we remind ourselves of the gifts that we give to God's service through the ministries of this church. The time and the talent, the energy and the treasure. And we lift them up to God. A loving God, we lift up these, our humble offerings, unto you, that they may be magnified by your love and put to your service here on this earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, my friends, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, and render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, and honor all people. And may the abundant love of God and the word that is Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.